Well, uh, good morning to everyone. This was a uh, sacramental that we had here. That's what we call things that uh, carry a uh, beauty and a grace with them, but are not sacraments themselves. So these, these are sacramentals. That means like holy water and ashes on Ash Wednesday. And uh, we haven't done this before, but uh, this year we did it. Uh, we had people bring in their palms from last year instead of just throwing them out. And uh, we burnt them. And we have another one this afternoon. And uh, so we got a whole pile of them. And you saw the flames going by here, did you not? They were shooting way up in the air. Yeah. The, um, in, in fact, they got, they got a, a balloon and it just blew up. But I can't read it, though, because it's <laughs> just Chinese to me. <laughs> I, I did tell people in there that uh, when, you know, you go to a football game, that they have an Air Force would fly over. You know, you've seen that, you know, shh. Well, we had two geese fly over, you know, uh, out here. Of course, they wouldn't, they wouldn't come down close to the fire. I, I can talk goose, by the way. So, yeah, I can. And so uh, I heard them talking to each other. One of them says, you know, we're out of season. Thanksgiving is not here yet. So, oh, my. But, now, uh, what we're going to do today is uh, recall that the last time we were together, we had a review of everything that we had in uh, balsam, I'll call it a semester, I'm so used to schooling. And in that, uh, we brought about a uh, sense that Paul, uh, on his uh, missionary journeys, ended up in his second missionary journey in Corinth. He left uh, Antioch of Syria. By the way, Antioch of Syria is involved in that terrible earthquake uh, out uh, there. It's in the far uh, northeast of the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and it has a, a river there that comes from it. And that's where the early church really got a good start, because when the temple was destroyed and the Jewish people put to the cross and, and, and killed uh, by the Roman army because they foolishly thought they could take on the empire, and, uh, and a lot of them came up to Antioch because it was one of the four big cities of, of the uh, time, uh, Alexandria in Egypt, uh, Ephesus in Greece. Uh, of course, now we're in Corinth. Corinth actually was uh, before the year 44, before Christ. It was a dump because it, it had at one time been a city, but they didn't pay attention to it. So it was a dump. Along came... Julius Caesar, and and uh, there uh, he so he took that area and built up a city. So from the year forty four on, uh, we had a city in Corinth, and eventually it would number uh, thousands upon thousands of people, a uh, hundred uh, worshiping temples there, as you want to call them that, uh, for each for a different god. Uh, you, you know, you, people uh, have to take this from a anthropological point of view that there hasn't been since the time of Adam and Eve to the per last person on planet earth. Uh, everyone has a God that we cannot escape from the fact you say, well, wait a minute. I didn't, I didn't know I had a God when I was five years old. Yes, you did. You had something in your mind that was as close as you want to be to something meaningful for you. Could be, you know, a snack, could be a pushki or something like that. Uh, could be some kind of a, I, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, that's the, uh, that's the Irish way of saying it. Um, so, well, let's uh, get into our business. We had a, a, a kind of a review. And uh, what I did for this uh, lesson, because uh, chapters one and two are fairly short. And so it gave us the opportunity to have some further discussion of Paul on his uh, journeys and, and on his letter writing. And uh, what I, I want to uh, point out to you is that I had... Uh, person come to me because at one of uh, our masses, I had mentioned that there are eight steps to a pilgrimage, talking about Jesus who went to the furthest northeast in the gospel of Mark to a mountainside peppered with all kind of God niches and things. And uh, there uh, he started his journey to Jerusalem. And so he actually was going then on a, a journey. And uh, on this uh, journey, he's going to stop at Capernaum. That's going to be what, you know, the next kind of stop. And then he's going to continue on. 
and then he will get to Jerusalem where he will have seven days, in, according to Mark, uh, before he's crucified. And so I, I gave you a, 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 a listing uh, to show, well, God's calling me to tell me, uh, keep moving. Uh, oh, okay. All right. I'll do that. No, and, and don't be sorry. We, oh, my, oh, my goodness. See, those geese were a hint. Yeah. The, uh, the, the steps that I, I've uh, adumbrated for you here are uh, on the left-hand side. These are the characteristics of all pilgrimages or journeys. And uh, if just to take a look at the first one, we'll tell you right off that you're in deep territory because in fact, the first one says, why are you making a pilgrimage? Why are you leaving here to go there and then to come back? Why are you doing that? So you have to uh, uh, elucidate very carefully what the purpose of your journey is. Uh, it's not just a wandering. If it's wandering, then that must be your journey to say, I'm going to be as Abraham was in the Bible. He says, I'm a wandering Aramean. So, you know, he's, he's uh, admitting to the fact that he's all going to be all over the place. Uh, think about Abraham. He ends up in Egypt. Uh, he, he tries to sell off his wife. <laughs> uh, uh, I can't, can't get into this. Uh, then uh, uh, he's going to be eventually buried down in uh, Hebron. So uh, anyway, so this, this gives you uh, the categories there. And I had one of these uh, that I made up for Paul. And you can see that if you read, you know, the, these materials we're going to cover today, some of this is going to be just a, a gift to you, and you can take it home and read it at, at your will. So if you take a, you know, by looking at this type of thing, you see, yes, I see that there, we can think logically and carefully about uh, how to make a pilgrimage. For example, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't go on a side trip, you know, when they say, hey, psst, come here, come on down the alley, you know, or something like that. Uh, don't do that. Keep yourself focused. And remember that the journey itself is part of the journey. The journey itself means that you are uh, increasing your soul, your expanse, your understanding of what it is. Um, I myself have been on many uh, journeys and many, uh, many uh, pilgrimages of some merit. Not, not for me, I'm kind of blunt at times, but for the fact of the beauty of this world. Well, then uh, the next thing I wanted to point out to you here is just our schedule for what between now and the end. Uh, today, uh, we, we had the review last week. Now we're going to do chapters one and two. And uh, then when we get done with uh, chapters 11, 12, and 13, which is the last part, uh, page uh, uh, 10 and 11 uh, still has to be uh, monitored for us. And we will have to distribute that later. Uh, so when we finish with that, we will be finished with Paul's second letter. Uh, but then we move into Holy Week. And I thought to myself, you know, not to try to stretch things out into Holy Week uh, so that we'd actually finish the letter. That's how I arranged it this way, so that we would finish before Holy Week. However, on Tuesday of Holy Week, which is April 4th, we could, if you want, uh, come to a, a kind of um, option, if you want. Uh, you, you know, in other words, uh, uh, I can maybe get a, a feel for this uh, as we move along. Here are some possibilities. We could take a, a just for that day, because it's during Holy Week, we could take a letter from Peter. Uh, that might be interesting to find out what he has to say. Uh, and uh, he talks a lot about the church. You are the temple of God. Uh, then uh, I'm, I'm going to skip the Johannine. Then the Hebrew passages are from the book of Hebrews, which is to the Jewish people who have become Christians, they need to know they made the right choice. And so the letter to the Hebrews means, I'm going to give you this letter that Jesus Christ is the king of the universe. And they're, they're going to understand that. It's a beautiful letter. It's the most beautiful piece of scripture is the book, the letter of Hebrews. Uh, or we could take some of the prophecies of old, you know, the ones from Amos and Isaiah, especially Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the others. I like this idea of the Johannine hour of glory because it's chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 in John's gospel with its highlights. We don't have to read everything. We can read its highlights. But that is what we uh, hear on Good Friday. So if you're coming to the Good Friday service, uh, this might be a good option for you because of the fact that what we could do here is, is um, kind of get the gist of what's going on because it is the Last Supper sermon. 
uh, that uh, John has. So anyway, we can talk about that later. Now, the next thing I want to do is to start taking a look at some of these pages that we have. And uh, so uh, you have to turn to the back side of this page and you can see that uh, we have here an outline of 2 Corinthians. Remember, 1 Corinthians kind of like had two big bulging uh, sequences. One was all the problems that the people in Corinth were having at Paul is land basting them. And uh, then the second part is uh, how to attend the Eucharist and the resurrection of Christ. So that second part from chapters 11 on to the very end uh, are the real significance because of the fact that Paul now has gone through twice uh, of many of these uh, cities in Turkey because he did on his first missionary journey. Then uh, he went back home. Then eventually he comes back and he reverses himself and goes back. And uh, this time he ends up at Troas, which is a city. We'll take a look at that. And, uh, and what he does is he, he crosses over from the Mediterranean there, gets over into uh, what we would call uh, Europe. So you have the uh, uh, other side is kind of like the, the side of, the, of uh, Asia. Uh, and uh, the other side is the side of Europe at Istanbul. So then what we have is um, a, a, a move that uh, takes him to Philippi, to Thessalonica, to Berea, to Athens, and eventually to Corinth. Corinth fits into uh, his program fairly well because he is uh, by trade. He's not going to sponge off people. Uh, what do you mean by sponge off people? Well, I, well, I could tell you because that's what I do. Uh, so um, what you do, <laughs> you kind of use people to <laughs> maybe make your life more comfortable. And uh, so he doesn't do that. He, he, he works uh, and uh, does the, the work of a person working with leather. And he meets some Christians who got thrown out of Rome, uh, Aquila and Priscilla. She, we, his, her friends call her Prisca, so we'll do that. And uh, she's a lovely lady. And so he, he kind of ties in with them and they, they with him. So they follow him for the rest of his time. And uh, they, they, uh, so uh, that's what's happening. Then eventually what Paul does is he goes back to Ephesus and then he'll go back to uh, uh, Jerusalem. And then he'll do his third missionary journey, which is a disaster. So you can see here, uh, you don't have to, we don't have to read this, an outline of Second Corinthians. You can just see that there is uh, some headlines here. First of all, there's a greeting and uh, then Paul's relationship with them. And then Paul talks about his own ministry. And then uh, he uh, has a, a crisis and um, uh, a, a resolution of the crisis and then the collection for Jerusalem. And that will take kind of the last two sections here, even though it says Paul's defense of his ministry, he's really looking for a, a collection to go back to the Jews who are in real trouble back in Israel, because now this is, letter is written in about the year 56. And uh, during that time, uh, the, the Jewish Christians have been taken on by the Jews because of the fact they think that these people now become heretics. And so they isolate them. And so they don't, if you're a widow or you're an older person or you need you help with, you usually go to the temple and they give you a couple of coins and then you can buy your food for that for the day. Remember the lady who throws in, in the gospel, throws her money into the big thing. You know, what, interesting kind of, you say, well, it was it a big barrel. The way they made the barrel was to take a giant fish standing up like this with a wide open jaw like this. So when you walk by to throw your money in, poo. You can hear it clink it all the way down, but it's a big thing. It's not some little you know, thing. So uh, you, you make kind of a noise. So uh, there, that's an outline. So we know now that there is some organization to this. Now what we're going to do is take a look at the next page. And the next page is a map. And correct. Paul's companions on the third journey. Well, this is a awkward. Here you can see what we're dealing with here is uh, these are some of the cities where Paul is at. This, let's start at Ephesus. This will be the, the uh, uh, and so you can see how the third journey, Ephesus, he comes there and he, st he stays there for a long time. He spends about three years there in Ephesus. That's where he writes these letters from, is from Ephesus. And uh, he, he got taken in by uh, a uh, man of the synagogue, and then they bounce him out of there because they don't want him, uh, you know, moving in with them, uh, even though the man was generous. 
then he goes to a rich man's home. Now, if you go to Ephesus at the city, you can find up in the front on the library, going all the way back to 100 years or so after uh, the uh, time of Christ, uh, some time afterwards, they decide to build a great library. And on that library coming down, they have the names of all the rich people, you know, who, uh, you know, kicked in some money. And it's still there. Well, that's the house that Paul got into. He got into one of those rich man's homes. And by that, I mean that their rooms or some of the rooms are uh, almost like this. It's almost like a small gym. You know, they're that big. How do I know that? Because I sat at the top of that hill and looked down. I was there in 1990 and all that was still under dirt. Now I am uh, at the top and I'm looking down and they had an aluminum set of stairs all the way up to the top. So it'd be like maybe uh, eight, 10 stories high minimum. And I had the opportunity for, and I can't explain the whole thing. I had the opportunity to sit down on the top of that hill and have an hour long conversation with the head uh, uh, person who was in charge of the archeology span excavation of the city of es Ephesus over 40 years. So this is the gentleman who was in charge of the archeological exposure of the city of Ephesus. And I had a chance to talk to him for an hour. You say, well, what was, what could you say to the man? I said, I can only say two things. The first thing was I had a question and I gave him the question and he talked for half an hour. And uh, then I, uh, and they, they looked at me and I, I didn't want to applaud, that's kind of cheesy. Uh, and then I asked a second question and he talked for a half an hour, okay? Now I was with my uh, colleagues from the uh, Institute of Biblical Archaeology, whatever you want to call it. We're biblical archaeologists, that's what we are, we're certified. And uh, they, they had gone up into the hills because there was some scribble on a cave wall. And I said, well, yeah, you go there. I'm going to sit here. And this guy came along. He was an older man at that time. And I, I was a younger man at that time by, by that time, which was some years ago. <laughs> oh. So anyway, so let's, let's start there. See, see uh, from Ephesus, eventually Troas is where you cross over. You can see there's two sets of lines here. One is uh, on this third journey and the other one is on the way back. And so uh, what you do at Troas, by the way, Troy is right up the road there. You know, you've all heard about the Helen of Troy, but this is Troas. And you, you can take a ship across. And when you take a ship across, you get off. You see where it says Philippi? Well, there's a landing place there, a little island called Neapolis and Philippi. And now on Paul's second missionary journey, that's where he met Lydia. And uh, so then he comes down here to Thessalonica. He has to leave there early. Don't follow the dotted line. That was the, uh, and then go to Berea and then all the way down to Corinth. And it says Paul spends three months in Achai, which is Greece, and he probably wrote uh, Romans during this time. So that's just uh, kind of a, a, a sense. I thought if you had a little map, at least it would show you, you know, where these various places are. The main cities that we're going to talk about are Corinth and uh, uh, Ephesus. There is a town below that called Miletus. That'll be important because uh, Paul on his missionary journey back does not want to stop in Ephesus. Why not? Because of the fact that uh, he, people would cry, and they would hold on to him. And so he wants, so he goes down to Miletus, but they follow him down there. Very moving passage in the Acts of the Apostles. They hug Paul, they, they hold on to him. They say, we don't leave us, don't leave us, but he does. Okay, he has to go to, so now what we have on the next page uh, or on the backside, whatever it is, uh, you can see Second Corinthians. And, and you can see, uh, and this is what uh, you can read during the week, just to review everything. And you can see what it is, is an overview, because there is a book that, says, that has uh, the New Testament in it. And the way that they show you the New Testament is to take uh, a, the chapters that have been agreed for, for these uh, letters and things like that. And uh, so uh, this one here, this uh, a reading is, uh, you can see a commentary, chapter one, a commentary, chapter three, four, five. And then uh, if you look even on the next page, you can see the same, if you have to turn the page, I think you can see the, the next side of this as well. In other words, there are two, two of these uh, things on Second Corinthians. So what you can do, if you want to read the whole letter by commentary, instead of just listening to me, what you can do is you can go home and you can look at what uh, is the first chapter about what is the second chapter about the third chapter, the fourth chapter? They, they, they go right on there, all the way down to chapter 13. So this is kind of like a, a, verb, a, a, a literary 
a, a following of the movement of the letter. Okay, so that will be helpful for us, uh, but I leave that to you. Then on the backside or uh, whatever it is, you have when and where Paul wrote his letters. And I thought this might be of some help for us because uh, well, I say, well, you know, how these things happen. I just make a, just a generic comment or two first. One uh, generic comment is this, most of the letters at that time were very short. These letters of Paul are, are more like dialogues of a very long nature. How about the one to Romans? Romans is, there are two monstrously difficult books to read in the New, in the New Testament. Uh, one is the book of Revelation. Whoa, try to get a hold of that. Uh, there's so many kind of metaphors in there. And then secondly is uh, this letter to the Romans because there's a lot of theology in there and a lot of um, kind of uh, metaphysics as well as incredible poetry. I mean, there are poetry there. He says, uh, uh, he, he, uh, he says uh, my mind is like, like a person at Christmas time uh, looking out over a, a balcony and looking down to see the presents. You know, he's got, so, he's got some poetry in there as well. So let's take a look at this. Uh, in Paul's second journey, he goes to Troas, Macedonia, or Corinth. Macedonia is the larger area, like Illinois and Chicago, you know. So anyway, he goes to Corinth. And when is he there? Well, he's there probably somewhere in the year 48 to 52. He would write a letter to the Galatians. Now, the Galatians, by the way, are the ancestors of the Irish. You wouldn't think about that. Now, I know that we have a good a Polish uh, uh, contingent in our parish. We also have a wonderful uh, uh, people from different parts of things, you know, from the Philippines or from other parts. And so there's all kinds of things. And we have some Irish. And so uh, the uh, Galatians there, eventually they move from northern Turkey over to northern France and then from northern France to Scotland and from Scotland over to Ireland. Uh, all this in two in, in a thousand years or so. So anyway, uh, so any, so that's what Paul, and he writes these letters. Now that he writes a letter to the Thessalonians because they've got a problem. They think that the uh, end of the world is going to come right away. <laughs> so he, you know, you, you don't get married, you don't do anything. You, you eat, drink, and be merry, I suppose, you know, is the idea of uh, Ecclesiastes. So, but because they think that the world is going to end because Paul said that, you know, and Jesus said that. He says, you know, I will return. And so uh, it didn't quite work out that way. So uh, then uh, the third journey, uh, he uh, now is in Ephesus for a long time, as I mentioned, and he's also down in Corinth. And he writes uh, uh, from Ephesus over to Corinth. And uh, now there's two ways to get to Corinth. One is to take 300 mile boat trip across uh, the waters or to take a, a horseshoe type thing up around Troas and then coming down and that's about 800 miles. <laughs> So because you're walking back and forth, you know, and stuff. So uh, anyway, uh, I was talking about a generic uh, discussion of letters, letters being short, these letters being long, as Paul has it. He, we got one, we got these uh, second letter here already has, you know, the 13 chapters in it. So uh, the, uh, then he's in the captivity in Rome, and that's from the year 58 to 63. And here he writes from his, uh, he, the first uh, place that he's in the, jail is not a, a, a bad jail it's like a house arrest uh, they have a guard there but they Paul can move around uh, and uh, people come visit him Timothy comes to visit him other people come to visit him uh, Luke comes to visit him other people come to see him and uh, so and but he writes these letters to Philemon which is a, a slave who uh, wants to stay with Paul uh, Colossians, which is the city of Colossae, has a magnificent phrase at the very first chapter, which says, Jesus was the firstborn of creation. You say, well, what does it mean by that? Firstborn means that the whole purpose of creation was for Jesus. Because uh, the theology we follow is this. God wanted to have godness outside of godness. Why that? Because God is love, Father, Son, and Spirit. And uh, love itself always wants to look for ways in which they can love something. And so uh, what God wants to do is to love Godness outside of God. Now this might sound awkward to you, but that is the whole of the universe. That is why we are here. I have said this before umpteen times, I'll probably say it that there's some time here, that there are two things that you 
can say that will encapsulate the entire project of the cosmos. Why was the cosmos here? So let's uh, begin. There's two things to say that tell you the whole history of the cosmos. The first is, let it be done to me according to your will. In other words, Jesus, the Lord, God outside of God in human form, is going to be born of a woman who says, let it happen according to your will, O God. So it's the will of God that this woman gives forward this child who is the Savior. The second thing that you need to know then after the fact that Jesus walked with us is the crucifixion where Jesus says, Father, it is finished. This is in the Gospel of John. It is finished. In other words, his whole mission in life, human life, was to bring about a movement of the humankind into eternity because they lost that privilege when the, the, the sin of Adam and Eve. Consequently, what we have here is the beauty of eternal life. And uh, so you can uh, tell that, that uh, how significant that is, because all of a sudden we are, are, are alive with our own purpose. Up to that time, many people, as the Sadducees, for example, they wouldn't believe in any resurrection or any life after that death. Ecclesiastes, the same thing. What does Ecclesiastes say? Vanity of vanity, vanity of vanities. Everything is a vanity. Five times that word comes in the very first sentence that everything is a vanity, meaning it's useless. Why is it useless? Because you're going to die. And if you die, you're gone. That, that's all there is to it. So um, anyway, uh, so I, I, uh, I, I wanted to get those kind of thoughts in. So now the way that these letters get uh, taken is you write them. Uh, I, I have uh, scrolls in, in my office uh, that are a thousand years old and they're sheepskin, you know, and, they, and they, they, so anyway. Uh, so, but in those days they wrote on papyrus, which is a, a, a reed that they would weave together, going cross cross and stuff like that real tight. Then they would water it and then they would roll it and it would become kind of like a sheet. Now they have just discovered a, a four, hundred year old Bible, by, by hundred year old, I mean, before the time of Christ, uh, when the, somebody wrote out the Jewish uh, letters and uh, put it into a book. They've just discovered this. Somebody had it, uh, but now it's out in the public. Uh, can you imagine that? Uh, one of these uh, up in, uh, uh, up, up in uh, the uh, northern part of uh, the uh, University of St. John also has an, an abbey there. And at the Abbey, they decided to get some money. They got $8 million. And over a period of some 10 years, they wrote out the Bible, the whole thing. And they wrote it out with the uh, letters and stuff like that that they had enjoyed. And you got great big, huge books. I saw some of this being made before they put it into a book. And so, so that, that's what's happening here, is that uh, people would write these letters. And usually they're letters of condolence or of history or of bargains or of work and stuff like that. They have uncovered, for example, if you go to some of these uh, places up near Syria, they have uncovered vast amounts. I'm, I'm talking about the size of this room of what would we would call coins. In other words, they're all there. What, what are those things? Those are little tiny pieces of clay on which they put a, a little element. And that tells you how many barrels you have or how many sheaths you have or how many other type things you have. So instead of saying, well, I, here's my here's my uh, I'm selling you a, a sheath of, uh, of wheat so that you can make bread. No, 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 no. What they do is you get a little uh, chip here and you turn that in and then they give you the stuff. So uh, so that's, that's a possibility as well. So these letters uh, that uh, go back and forth with the uh, apostles are significant and uh, cause us to uh, kind of stand in awe. Now, what I'm uh, going to do is uh, take a look at chapter one and chapter two. That is our work for today. And... Uh, along with the fire burning. So, so if they ask you on the bus on the way home, you oh, what'd you do today? Well, we smoked for a while in the basement. <laughs> As you can see, uh, the way that um, my commentary comes to you is to put down some thoughts on significant phrases or words. For example, let's start with verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to have to stop frequently. 
why why would you even think that you Paul would have to introduce himself that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus because he wants to get that identity uh, here's a little metaphor burnt into their minds yes he wants to have them to know that this Paul is the very one that they heard about who was knocked over and given 180 degrees instead of persecuting uh, the people of God, uh, he becomes a, a proponent of the people of God. And so it, that's why he calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus. Then he has this addition to that, by the will of God. See, Paul never forgets for a second how all of this took place. It just wasn't like Paul said, because he was a brilliant scholar. Uh, they had two uh, nationally, internationally known scholars in Jerusalem. They were the ones who are the maximum knowledge people. Because in those days, people didn't read. About 5% of the human race could read. Uh, that's why you have so many images. And uh, so, uh, but these people uh, had all the texts in their mind memorized, or they had writings and scrolls. For example, the uh, library at Alexandria, uh, and one of the wonders of the ancient world, had over 2,000 scrolls. So these scrolls would be these papyrus things rolled up into a roll, so then it would be there. So when the you know Romans came through and destroyed it, they burnt a library. That's terrible, but they did it. So, but those rolls are there. So if you wanted to go to uh, discover uh, metaphysics, you'd go to Alexandria because they took the works of Socrates uh, and uh, Plato and Aristotle and they wrote them down. And uh, the same with uh, mathematics, they were very strong on mathematics. And so these type of things would have been in case there. And, and so gave us kind of a sense. And uh, strangely that when the Muslims came in uh, and into that area and stuff, uh, they, they pursued uh, mathematics. And so they became very uh, highly educated in that area. So I'm, it's easy for me to get off of the topic. <laughs> so let's continue. Paul never forgets that what happened to him uh, is God's will. And so, excuse me. So if, if you think that Paul is a kind of an ego-centric person, right, we would be entirely wrong. Uh, he is the most humble of people. Why? Because he is assured that everything that happens to him happens because of God's will. It is not that uh, he, Paul walks around saying, I, the great scholar, you know, and stuff. He, he knew everything about it. And, uh, and so uh, the, uh, uh, it, it doesn't uh, bother him to say, I am here to give you Jesus the Christ because Jesus the Christ made it to be that way. And uh, so it's interesting that we would have kind of like the most knowledgeable turn into what Paul would say would be the least knowledgeable because we can read the scriptures, but only with the idea that they illuminate for us God, the divine. So if we're reading scriptures like the law, you can eat this, you can't eat that, you can do this, you can't do that, uh, that, that is irrelevant. But if it's a prophecy of which there are about 300 that prepare you for the Christ, then you've got a lot of literature there. How about the literature we just had uh, on Isaiah that we read, you know, at the burning of the ashes there. So let's uh, continue. And Timothy, our brother. So you see, uh, Timothy uh, uh, got in with Paul in this fashion. I hope uh, I could use a hand map. I don't have a big map here. Okay, you know what hand map is? Okay, you watch the hand, okay? <laughs> You're supposed to say Mediterranean. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. Okay, and then you leave from the east and you start going west. Oh, there's a big island there, Cyprus. So you walk the whole length <laughs> of Cyprus with Barnabas and Mark and you get to the governor. And you talk to the governor and he writes a letter of recommendation and they get on a boat and they go north. And Mark says, you're taking a route that goes where all the brigands and pirates and lustful people are. I'm not gonna have any of that. And he leaves. 
leaves Paul. So it's Paul and Barnabas, and they go up north to an Antioch of Pisidia, not the Antioch over here of uh, Syria. And uh, then he makes a journey, and the journey goes back to the east for four towns. And one of them is the town of Lystra, where Paul gets the daylights beat out of him. And, uh, and who sees that? A man named, Tim, uh, named Timothy. Timothy in the Hebrew means uh, Timon. And, and, and so he, he's, you know, he's not a braggadocious kind of guy, but, but what he sees is Paul being abused like this. But his mother and his grandmother are there too. And the grandmother has become a Christian. And the mother is a Jew and the father is a Greek. So he's got all this heritage, but the Christian heritage is what attracts him. So now that we're on the second journey, what we get is uh, Timothy following Paul, and he doesn't let go. He's with him for about 17 years. That's why Paul can say, uh, I, I am Paul, and Timothy, our brother, is with me, and, and we to the church of God that is in Corinth. Uh, you got to love these phrases because they, they are so uh, rich in meaning. He says, he doesn't say, yeah, here we are, and uh, there's a, you know, a pup tent uh, built up as a temple uh, in, uh, in Corinth. No, we are in the church of God, you know, not talking about any building, but talking about the spacious, uh, expansive soul that one after another people are kind of uh, rationing themselves uh, to uh, become a, a not just a Jew, but a Jew who was belonged to Christ, or a, especially in Corinth, a Gentile. And uh, it, uh, it is a wicked town, as I've already indicated uh, slightly. I don't want to get too much into that. Uh, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a terrible town. They, they, there was a word, uh, we talked about this in the last, uh, in the fall, the word about uh, going to Corinth, it's Corinthiadzain, which is like going to lose your senses in uh, lust and playing cards or spears or other type things. And so it's uh, it's all useless because you go to you know you, you pay off the god that you want in the, their their small little temples. Uh, so blessed be the god. It says uh, grace to you. Oh, excuse me. The God is in Corinth with all the holy ones throughout Acacia. See, that's a collection in mind. See, the holy ones. Uh, he's talking not about their actions as much as it is that they have people that have converted in their mind and their soul that God is. And that it is the God that has been prophesied to us, been Jesus the Christ. So it says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see how uh, careful Paul is here. He's telling a particular area. Uh, has been named already uh, the Sakaya, which is upper part of uh, Macedonia. Then uh, let's continue now. So that's the greeting. Now we're going to go to Thanksgiving. And you can see it goes from verse 3 down to verse 11. And it's the Thanksgiving. Uh, you can be sure that Paul would do, say something like this. Why? Because he's only Paul, uh, the, the apostle, because of the fact that God made him that way. Uh, you say, well, did he force it on him? No. Uh, because God doesn't do that. But what he does is he invites. Well, when you're laying on your back and you lost your sights and you can't get anything deep, you might think it over. Mm, uh, yeah, well, maybe uh, there's something here. So, blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and God of all encouragement. So he's already identified to the Corinthians what they have uh, experienced. So that, that they already have experienced compassion. How is that? Well, remember in Corinth, they, they had a, somebody who goofed off and got thrown out. And, well, this God is going to show compassion to him now that we get the second letter. See, and of all encouragement, in other words, what is the center part of encouragement? Courage. They are put to death on a regular basis here and there. Uh, there is in Nigeria today, uh, 24 hours, and every hour there will be a Catholic Christian who dies uh, because of the uh, punishment that the, the oppressors are, are giving to them in this area. In Nigeria, it used to be one of the greatest of the African countries, but they've been taken over. And well, of course, we, uh, we know already of all of the other tensions in the world. So, Father of Compassion, all encouragement, who encourages us in our every affliction. See, and what he's thinking about here is the way that they treated him in Ephesus, because in Ephesus, they finally got mad at Paul. Why would that be? Ephesus had one of the great wonders of the ancient world. There's seven of them. And uh, it is the Temple of Diana. And it was a magnificent building. There, you say, is there any part of it left? Yes, there is. There is. There's part of it left. Okay. 
it's the size of a garbage can over here. And that's it. That's all that's left. Whereas they had these magnificent pillars going way up into the sky and stuff like that before. And uh, oh my God, uh, excuse me. Oh my, uh, oh my. Oh my. <laughs> There, there is Diana up there, uh, and uh, and so she holds the moon across the sky. She's the god of love. See, so people go there. Uh, she uh, sometimes is pictured as a woman with uh, fifty breasts, and uh, so and you uh, would go there with your prayers and things like that. Say, make me fertile, make me able to have children. And there also you would find uh, all these silver makers because they would have little kind of uh, clay things that would have, and you pour in liquid silver from the heat and it would make a little statuette and you could take it home with you. How many times have you gone, you know, to, uh, like my uh, mom and dad, when I was a little kid, uh, I, I didn't get along with it too well, but, you know, but uh, occasionally they let me in off the porch. So uh, uh, anyway, they went to Notre Dame for a football game and came back. Of course, I couldn't go with them because my uh, two brothers, older brothers, they, you know, they only had four tickets. So um, anyway, so, but they came back with a nice uh, shirt or something like that with Notre Dame on it. So wasn't that great? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I haven't thought about that in my lifetime. So uh, the, uh, what, we, what we get here though, is something, this uh, treatment, see, is our every affliction. Paul comes in and says to the people of Ephesus, those images are fake gods. They have nothing to do with anything else. They're fake. They even bring him down to the giant uh, amphitheater. And some people say that they have the amphitheater is uh, uh, a, a place of uh, death and things like that. They say it's like vomit. Well, it's only vomit because the people, when they're leaving, uh, you know, uh, get sick. Uh, so the whole thing is just a mess. But they, they think that they're going to, Paul is going to go to the lions. And so what they do is they just say, you know, maybe this is not working well. So he gets out. So they treat him bad. They beat the daylights out of him, uh, as Paul will tell us later on in many ways. So, uh, so to encourage us who are in any affliction with the encouragement with which you ourselves are encouraged by God. So in other words, he says, my uh, devotion in life, the very fact that I am anxious about my faith uh, is a gift of God to me. For as Christ's sufferings overflow to us, so through Christ is our encouragement also overflow. You say, oh, what a beautiful metaphor this is. God is like pouring, you know, a, a beautiful kind of a, a nutrient uh, into us. And what do we do? We automatically go to someone else to give that same nutrient, which is to know Christ. Uh, Thomas Merton of the great saint of Louisville area, Kentucky, the, uh, the Trappist monk said this, he said, oh, each one of us is a gift of God, but it does not become a gift unless we give it away. So in other words, we cannot say, oh, I am a good Catholic unless I give kind of the things that go along with that, charity, kindness, forgiveness, uh, encouragement, uh, happiness, joy, wonder, uh, awesomeness, you know. Um, so uh, these are the type of things that we have to pay attention to that uh, the encouragement of Paul is overflowing and uh, says, if we are afflicted, it is for your encouragement and salvation. For if we are uh, encouraged, it is for your encouragement, which enables you to endure the same suffering we have. Whoa, is that a heavy conclusion? Meaning that, you know, you're going to be uh, in the same boat that we are, no, no pun intended, because he was in a three boats that crashed. And uh, the last one, uh, he got on a timber and landed on the Malta and then went up to Rome to eventually to be, uh, to be executed. He says, our hope for you is firm, for we know that as you share in the sufferings, you also share in the encouragement. So you see, as we get into this letter, what Paul is doing is he's transferring. He's telling people, and they can see by the, the style that he has, uh, there is a, a letter about Paul uh, from Clement, the, one of the popes, one of the early popes, and he mentions uh, what uh, Paul looked like. He said a short guy. Um, and he, he wasn't very, you know, tough or anything like that. And, uh, and a uh, bearded guy and, you know, and, and, uh, and he had some kind of a difficulty in speaking. And uh, he also, uh, they, they don't uh, uh, know much more about him than that. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought, you know, he'd be like a Superman uh, with a, you know, a, a voice of, um, 
I don't know, some famous orator. And uh, no, that was not Paul. They, they could see his enthusiasm is what, what does enthusiasm come from? And uh, this is Greek, and theos, he says, in God. Enthusiasm means you're in God. So, so that's what he's got there, the same suffering. So I'm on verse eight now, uh, or seven. Our hope for you is firm, for we know that as you share in sufferings, you also share in encouragement. And then he says, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that came to us in the province of Asia. See, Asia means uh, uh, Ephesus. See, the F eh, got cut. That's just sus. So think of that. Uh, so we were utterly weighed down beyond our strength, so we despaired even of life. Wow, this must be some difficulty Paul had. But he stayed there those years, as I mentioned. Indeed, we had accepted within ourselves the sentence of death. Thanks for the musical background to so, uh, it, it covers over the reality of, of death. I, just, I, I have to think about this. Imagine every night that uh, as you're tired as can be, you may have walked 12 to 20 miles. In those days, to walk 20 miles was not a problem. Everybody did it. And so you're tired and you're just going to collapse. And all of a sudden it comes to you, I'm never going to wake up again. Why? Because uh, I, in all the things I did today emptied myself of my life and now they're going to come and put me to death. And so the, you have that anxiety and that fear. Every single place you go, you know that there is going to be a visible and a thorough a beating and a harshness and rejection. And you're gonna go on no matter what. So we're dealing here with uh, in incredible uh, weight of soul it says, verse nine, indeed we had accepted within ourselves a sentence of death that we might trust not in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. See, I put in there this Paul steady drumbeat of resurrection. He cannot talk about these things unless He's talking about the resurrection. He rescued us from such a great danger of death. He will continue to rescue us. In him we have put our hope that he will also rescue us again. See, because I put down there, Paul could have had an early martyrdom. He could have been, he could have been martyred before he left uh, Damascus, where, where he had to stay for some time to catch his breath, to get his eyes back, to get instruction about Jesus, the Lord. And he had to change his whole mindset. And you can be sure that what they say to him is, so Paul, have you read uh, these uh, things from Isaiah? Or what about Jeremiah? Or what about Ezekiel? Or what about Hosea? Or how about Amos? No question about it. It was an astounding event. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the uh, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the the anxiety. I suppose the dreadful anxiety follows you all the time. So uh, you know, you might talk about the physical impairments that he gets. That, that's nothing compared to the soul impairments that are put upon him. That he has to be the one to do this. Uh, so when he was in Damascus, like I say, he had to find out about Christ and he had to find out about Christ from the people that were there. They were, they themselves had become Christian. And so, and then uh, there is a period that we don't know of the, where he went out into the desert, spent some considerable time there. Why? Because he has to commune with the Lord. So uh, now let's continue. Uh, verse 10, he rescued us from danger of death. He'll rescue us again. As you help us with prayer, so thanks be given by many on behalf of the gift granted us through the prayers of many. So uh, here uh, is his thanksgiving. He is thanking them, the people of Corinth, for praying for Paul in his absence. And the interesting thing about this is that the people of Corinth live in such a corrupt uh, area, but there is so much goodness that goes on in this Christian community they put aside all of the other corruptions and what they do is they uh, themselves take on uh, the beauty of Christ. So now we're going to continue with uh, in the next uh, uh, section, Paul's 
sincerity, and constancy. For our boast is this. See, this word boast comes up an awful lot in his letter. And so you're saying to yourself, well, if he's boasting, then he's an egotic, egotist. And uh, that's just far from it. What he is saying is, uh, I am so privileged to be the one that God will speak through me uh, to others. God will heal to others through me. It is not for Paul to establish a community and then stay with it. It is for Paul to bring about a community of faith and then to leave it to go to another place. So he is a, an evangelist, uh, is his task. But in doing so, what he's going to do is leave behind in each one of the cities or uh, areas, he's going to leave behind elders. That's the word that they would use. Uh, they understand elders, we would understand later in that century to be bishops. And those were the ones that would come in and to celebrate Eucharist with you, the breaking of the bread. And then they would also be the ones to ordain. And by the ordination, and this is in Clement's letter, uh, he said they would place their hands on you, just like they did for King David. You know, they placed their hands on you. And that, that's what the, uh, so if you see, uh, you know, a, a deacon or a priest or whatever be ordained, that's why we have uh, sacraments like confirmation, where we have a kind of a visual type thing of, uh, you know, of touching and, and uh, calling you by a new name and things like that is because there's been a change in who you are. Well, this is what Paul is. He's a new person. And so he says, the crisis between Paul and the Corinthians. Now, this is the tail end of chapter one. So uh, what we're going to get here is his final statement before we move on to the next uh, letter, part of the letter. For our boast is this. See, he's, he's not um, boasting as a way to polish himself, but to show that he is himself a, uh, the residue of God's encounter with humanity. The testimony of our conscience that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially toward you, with the simplicity and sincerity of God, and not by human wisdom, but by the grace of God. See, what Paul uh, continuously does is he goes after the smartness of this world. You say, well, that means he's anti-scientific, anti-philosophical, anti-linguistic, or whatever. No, that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about if you think that that is the whole of your being, you've missed the point. Now, two weeks ago in our bulletin, there was a letter from, or I should say, Kathy's Corner, and talked in that uh, in a lengthy uh, little essay. You should take a look at these things in our bulletins on Sundays. And her bulletin there was that Jesus uh, was, uh, uh, you know, see, see people say you are, you know, uh, half uh, of what you is your totality. What Jesus is saying is that he does not want to have people go about bragging about the fact that they were healed by Jesus. Remember several times over, especially in the Synaptic Gospels, he says, do not be telling anybody about this. The only one he allows to be telling people is the one he, who's the, the, the man who's all kind of wrapped up in hostility in, down in the area of the uh, Decapolis. Decapolis means 10 cities, and they're all Greeks. That doesn't mean when we say pagans, we don't mean that in a negative sense. We just mean that as a clarifying statement, that they are pagans. They are not religious people, and they are possessed by the devil. Uh, yeah, down there, the one guy is anyway, and and, and he gets cured, and the and the the uh, demons all go into the pigs who go into the, into the, uh, Galilee, Lake Galilee. So uh, the the result of that is that this man wants to stay with Jesus, and Jesus says, "No, I want you to go back and tell people what happened here, because that's the only messenger they will have about any of this, because Jesus is not going there into the interior of the Decapolis, but he doesn't want it to have in Capernaum or in uh, some of the other areas." of uh, Galilee, that Jesus' miracles are there, uh, such as in Jerusalem and stuff. He does not want people running around saying, oh, look at what Jesus did, look at what Jesus did, although they do it, but he doesn't want that. Why? Because that is not the whole truth of who Jesus is. See, if you say that Jesus is the healer, Jesus is the prophet, uh, Jesus is the one who gives encouragement or comfort, is that who Jesus is? And you'd have to say no. Jesus is the Savior, the one who will go through death to bring us to life. 
That is who Jesus is. You see, is that making sense? You know, the fact that Jesus doesn't want to quote unquote boast, doesn't want to have you know people get to know, you know, this takes place. But it happens in Mark's gospel on the very first night, the very first night, he, what did he do? Well, he, he, he was in the synagogue. He walks across the street, which is not even as wide as this. And uh, yeah, what's about like this? And he goes over to that house over there where Peter's mother-in-law is, and she's very ill. So he goes in, what does he do? He takes her by the hand, see, and uh, listen to this word, raises her up, <laughs> and she begins to serve. Now, some people, uh, because they don't look at this, think, oh, well, you know, that's a typical uh, a gender mentality. You know? <laughs> they do the cooking, we do the heavy stuff. Baloney. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, okay. So, uh, no, the word raised up, obviously, to the careful mind is he brings her out of death into life. See, in other words, this is a prelude to Jesus' death and resurrection. And then what does the good Christian do, male or female, young or old? Capacity or not capacity? What do we do? Serve each other. So she becomes then the kind of like the model, model the metaphor for a good Christian. So we have that kind of thing. So uh, anyway, the little girl, how about the little girl? Talitha Ka'um, I tell you, rise. How about the woman who was hemorrhaging? And uh, she says, I've talked to the, about, about this before. She says, uh, uh, that, you know, that she just touched the cloak of Jesus and, and she was cured. And uh, she says to Jesus, what he asks, who is that? She says, I've, I've been, I will have heavy suffering. I've had heavy suffering. And she had it for 12 years and spent all her money and stuff like that. Says, I will be suffering greatly as the Greek, suffering greatly. And that very passage is only found twice in all of scripture for her and for Jesus in the walk to Jerusalem. Three times Jesus will say, I suffer greatly. Very same phrase. So she takes Jesus' suffering, Jesus takes her suffering. Okay, so let's uh, continue here. Uh, we write, to, it says, uh, and especially towards you with simplicity and sincerity of God, and not by human wisdom, but by the grace of God. See, I put down there Paul, Paul's own weakness in the comfort of God. For we write you nothing but what you can read and understand, and I hope that you will understand completely. When he says, I write you nothing, it doesn't it mean he's writing them nothing. He, he means there's nothing that's bad. It says, with this confidence, as you came to understand us partially, that we are your boast as you are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. So he's telling the people of Corinth that he, Paul, can boast of the wonder and sanctity of the people of Corinth. Isn't that great? It'd be like if uh, today, you know, we finish here and somebody parks in the car because they're going to come in and, you know, say a prayer or something like that. They, they say, oh, my goodness. These are the people of God. I've, I've heard so much about the people of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. How wonderful they are, and terrific. And the devout, the devout people who devote themselves to uh, caring for each other. It's a family kind of atmosphere. See, so, well, yeah, there you are. So he says, with this confidence, I formally intend to come to you so that you might receive a double favor. Okay. Uh, are, do we have any questions or stuff before we move on to our next letter? Yes, please. Um, did the author of the letters of Paul, did those letters precede the writing of the Synoptic Gospels? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Mark is uh, the year 70, uh, Matthew uh, 80, uh, Luke 85, and John 90. Uh, so, however, each one of those has a school. This is not, you know, common knowledge. Each one of them would have a school. Like, why is John so different than the three synoptics? Uh, well, Matthew bases his on Mark, and Luke bases his on Matthew and Mark, and they have an outside source for each that adds a little bit of flavor to it. But in John's gospel, you get a whole brand new thing. You know, there's no infancy narrative. Why should there be? He's he's the son of God. So it's a divine, you know, um, birthday of the world, you know, when Jesus is here. So, uh, uh, John would have, a, a, he would probably be up in Syria, they think, uh, you know, quite a distance from uh, Jerusalem. On the other hand, he knows everything about Jerusalem. But, but what he does do is uh, he has a school there. And the school, 
here's these things because if we're dealing with jesus dying april 7th in the year 30 then we're dealing from that time on with the experience of jesus you know in resurrected form and so uh in these these collections of people that are doing this you know they're they're remembering people have great memories in those days i, I could prove it to you but i i just want to move on uh but they they, they that's why your question is so uh, important for us, because the fact that we find out that what Paul is doing is he is the scriptures now, uh, his letters and stuff like that. Peter has some letters and some others have letters. Most of those are letters using the names of the apostles, but they are written in the 80s or 90s uh, because they talk a lot about you know, ministry and other type stuff. They're not they're not talking about some of these things as, as much as Paul. Would. Does that help? Do, do we have time here? Yeah. 48. It's, 1048. I'm sorry, I still can't. 1048. It's 1048? Yeah. And we can go to. I'm going to talk very slow. <laughs> I think what we can do then is uh, finish this, then we can also take a look at some of the other paperwork that I gave you. So let's go to uh, chapter two, Paul. Now you're saying to yourself, pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. There's a whole half page left on chapter, on one. chapter one. Oh, there is? On the page. Oh, yeah, well, on the back, I'm sorry. Just just testing you out. Now you don't have to go as well. There's more. Yeah, that's right. But it's still a short letter. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that spacing so let's go to verse 16 uh, he says now he says uh, um he says I, I formally intend to come to you so you might receive a double favor now this this is kind of a little bit um heavy here but it's he says namely to go by way of macedonia which is greece then to come to you again on my return from macedonia and have you send me on my way to judea now, catch this. When I intended this, did I act lightly? Or do I make my plans according to human consideration so that with me it is yes, yes, and no, no, no in between? Now, what is Paul's thought about this group in court? He says, I'm going to come and see you. And then he starts to think it over and saying, if I show up, they're going to think about me the way he wrote his first uh, 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 letter of that we read uh, in our selection back in the fall, you know, the uh, opportunity that he gives there to go back means that he is going to uh, remember because we uh, we covered rather thoroughly the, the the challenges that Paul was given there, especially in, you know, the way they received the Eucharist, the way that they you know, didn't care about stuff. There was a, a person who was, uh, you know, uh, in uh, uh, a bad sexual situation and, and stuff like that. So, so Paul kind of gave it to him. That was pretty heavy on him through chapter up through chapter ten. He really went after him. So, what what's happening here in this letter is he's saying, you know, I thought about going back to you, but if I go back to you, you're going to think this is the same Paul that kind of smothered us <laughs> and and called us you know uh, as as uh, inept and, and and really changed our whole program around yes we became better for it but you know paul is kind of like straightforward uh he didn't mince uh, uh, up his uh, material he really went for him are uh, am i still making some sense what he's thinking is that the people of corinth if they see paul a second time are going to say this is the same um objective Paul that we had before. And so they're, they're not gonna have that same kind of uh, affection for him they might have had. So let's uh, continue to, let's go back to the uh, 16 again and read again. It says, so namely, to go for, through Macedonia, then to come to you in my return from Macedonia, and then you will send me on my way to Judea. And um, so, verse 17, when I intended this, did I act lightly? Or do I make my plans according to human consideration? So it's with me, yes, yes, or no, no. As God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. 
for the son of God, Jesus. He's still talking about this letter. He's already his appearance for the son of God, Jesus Christ, who was proclaimed to you by us, Silvanus and Timothy. See, these are his buddies that go with him all the time. And it was not yes and no, but yes has been in him. You see, uh, whenever Paul wanted to send a message, he'd use one of these guys, Silvanus or Timothy. For however, many are the promises of God, their yes is in him. Therefore, the amen from us also goes through him to God for glory. But the one who gives us security with you in Christ, who has anointed us in God, he has also put a seal upon us and given the spirit in our hearts as a first installment. But I call upon God as witness in my life. See, this is Paul's change of plan. That is to spare you that I have not yet gone to Corinth. Uh, if I have made this um, clear, then this is what we should have gotten out of my comments. Paul is thinking over, should I go back there and have them think of me as I was back then with my letter to them? Or should I just not be there at all? and send them a letter. And that's why I'm gonna send them this second letter. Does that make sense? He's, he's worried that, you know, and, and he's, he's kind of humble in a way by being so. You say, well, what, what, what do you mean humble? Well, he, he takes it and says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, if I go back there, I might have the same success I had before with so many people, but I just assume that I would stay out of it this time and write them a letter instead, and then they can read the letter without having my visage there and right in their face, you know? So I'm, yeah, I think this is a valid reading of it. Otherwise I wouldn't share it. <laughs> Not that we lord it over your faith, rather we work together for your joy, for you stand firm in the faith. Good old Paul, he's telling him, you stand firm in the faith after all these other things he said for him in the first mm -hmm. letter <laughs> halfway through. Now he says, oh, you people are great. <laughs> this is a, a wonderful combination of uh, Paul's uh, anticipation. So thank you. And uh, now what I'm going to do is go to chapter two. And the first thing I'm going to do is to see that it ends on this page. Although I might add, I have a wonderful uh, adjunct to our program by telling me about these things and not botching things up. So I appreciate that. See, I'm like Paul without being humble. Okay, so <laughs> let's continue now chapter two. Now you see, by the way, uh, if you, we go back to the uh, begin those pages that I had from that book, uh, obviously those things were Xerox, you know, where, where you have a commentary to most of the chapters you have the chapter and most of them there. So that's that's where uh, and we're into the early chapters now. So if you see something for chapter one or chapter two over this week, uh, then you can uh, you know take reread it in that fashion, see what they say about it. Then you can also go to three and four because you know the next topic we're going to have is chapter three and chapter four. Okay, so let's uh, now he says, if I decided not to come to you again in painful circumstances. Wow, what, what is his painful circumstances? He's uh, kind of beaten up by his uh, experience in Ephesus. So it's not a good deal, you know, to come there and mope. For if I inflict pain upon you, in other words, telling you over and over again, oh my God, you should have seen what they did to me. He says, if I inflict pain upon you, who was there to cheer me except the one pained by me <laughs> what an analysis of the crowd so what do we you know like there's a uh, hundred people there and there's one person who says you know paul we got enough of that stuff you're talking about <laughs> why don't you get on with it <laughs> so he, he even covers that he says if i if i inflict pain on you then who is there to cheer me up except the one pain by me <laughs> so in other words we experience your pain paul because you're putting it on us <laughs> And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not be pained by those in whom I should have rejoiced. Confident about all of you that my joy is that of all of you. 
And my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete as in his letter to Timothy, by the way, later on. He says that exactly. He says, uh, he says, uh, rejoice, rejoice always. And this is Paul waiting for his death. I'm talking about another letter, by the way. This is the letter to Timothy. And he says, uh, he says that what I want you to do is to have joy in yourself. Have all the joy you can. And, but, but he's in, writing this from a pit in the bottom of the Mamertine prison. It's a hole in the ground with a grate on the top. And they, they treat him like dirt. And uh, they're going to kill him. Uh, execute him. And uh, by, the, by the way, they have in this last century, starting in 1930, all the way through up till now, they have discovered the uh, remains uh, of uh, both Paul and Peter through our, our advancement of archaeology and stuff. Yes. You say, tell us more about that. Oh, no, no. I'm just going to let you hang for a while. But uh, so anyway, he says, uh, he says, confident about all of you that my joy is that of all of you. I, you got to love this phrase here because he's saying the joy in my life came from being with you, people of Corinth. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. That's his first letter. That, that's why I liked the idea of reviewing some of the first letter last, we did last week. Not that you might be pained, but that you might know the abundant love I have for you. This is Paul's deepest heart that we get experience of uh, in uh, his letters. Because uh, in his letters, he says wonderful things and things like that. But this letter especially gets us into the heart and the soul of Paul. He, he, when he, he's talking about tears and he's talking about love and talking about affection. And all, all the, this is wonderful. Okay, let's continue. If anyone, this is the offender, says, and, and who do you think the offender is? <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> the one who offended the law of a marriage. Remember that? If anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to exaggerate to all of you. This punishment by the majority is enough for such a person. Oh, he's going backwards now to that incestuous person member in the first letter. A man who can, and there were various ways in which we can understand incest, but whatever it was, he did it. And Paul is telling him in that first letter, throw the guy out. So now what's he saying? He says the punishment by the majority, in other words, that they've, they've turned their back on him is enough. He says, so that on the contrary, you should forgive and encourage him instead, or else that person may be overwhelmed by excessive pain. Ah, unbelievable. What he's saying is go get that guy. He's probably down some saloon uh, having this third or fourth gallon of wine uh, because of the fact that you guys threw him out and he is nothing now because he's lost his community, his people. And he says, whatever I did, I did. Uh, and it was wrong, period. Uh, isn't there any compassion for me? And then apparently there was none at Paul's request. Do you, have, do you follow me? That this is, a, this is really a 180 degree turn. He says, on the contrary, you should forgive and encourage him so that he doesn't get overwhelmed by excessive pain. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. That, now, that, that's why we have the sacrament of confession right now. Uh, for this is where, this is why I wrote to know your proven character, whether you were obedient and everything. See, so that's why he's saying, I'm not coming to you. I'm writing a letter to you instead. Whomever you forgive anything, so do I, or indeed what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything has been for you in the presence of Christ. So what he's saying is that this is not only Paul that should be reconsidering this poor gentleman's failure, but all of you should be compassionate towards this person. In fact, bring him in and make him better. Uh, we might've experienced something like that in our lives, uh, coming across people who uh, really uh, were broken and then all of a sudden, because of the fact of their courage, uh, came back. You, as you know, we have uh, in this building right here, uh, we have, I think, four different communities that gather at various times uh, to support each other and to uh, uh, encourage each other. And uh, so it becomes a holy place. You say, well, wait a minute. There was the, they were in these various groupings because they had these problems. That's what we're saying is 
that they're holy because of the fact that they have the courage to come in to try to work on it, to see that they can lead a better, more holistic life. And and that takes place right here in these walls, right, you know, right, right here. So uh, we are a kind of a continuance of what Paul is talking about here. Uh, so let's go to verse 10. Whomever you forgive anything, so do I for indeed what I have forgiven. If I have forgiven anything has been for you in the presence of Christ. See, so what he's saying is, and this is where our theology of confession is, the priest doesn't forgive someone's sins, does he? The, the priest is announcing that Christ gives you, you know, solace for your sinful error that you've made in life. That, that comes from Christ. It's, it's not, this is not a sociological uh, exchange. This is not a dear Abby or something like that. You know about Dear Abby, do you not? Lady? Yeah. She died. I th there's another Dear Abby now, but. Yeah. And, and you say, how did, how did I know all that stuff to be able to write so well about people's problems? <laughs> so so here's, here's how the Catholic Church works. There is a, in the, I'm going to go back to the 1980s. There is in the Jesuit community someone who was assigned to go to, excuse me, to go to any social event of merit. <laughs> For example, a friend of mine called, sadly, he said, uh, I, I have a favor. Oh, yes, what can I do for you? He says, I want you to celebrate my funeral mass. I said, oh my God, I said, what's, what's the matter? He says, I have pancreatic cancer and they told me I have just weeks to live. And he was a very famous lawyer downtown. And uh, so we had a downtown church and it was filled, filled uh, with largely men. I, you know, that's just the way it is. All lawyers, you know, knew him and reverenced him. So, and uh, so anyway, so I, I had the mass and all of a sudden this Jesuit priest shows up. Uh, to can celebrate well sure that's fine i said oh did you know the man gentleman says i will <laughs> <laughs> yeah well listen carefully <laughs> so anyway so guess who he made a friendship with dear abby so he would take her to if they had like a ball or some kind of a you know because she didn't have a husband there so he he would take her <laughs> so he's a jesuit priest out of the move, you know, so now there was another uh, person who, because of the fact of the nearness of their buildings where they lived, she lived right across from the bishop's place in downtown Chicago, and uh, our famous bishop, you know, uh, was dying, and uh, he had certainly won the hearts of so many people, and especially uh, the, the Jewish people. Because he went to their meeting that they had every like Friday night or something or Saturday night, they had a meeting of the Jewish rabbis, and he would go to it. Uh, our Cardinal Bernadine, and uh, so uh, on his deathbed, he writes a letter, a note to the Jewish meeting. He says, "I cannot come to the meeting tonight, as I am making another journey." Signed, Cardinal Bernadine, and shipped it off to them. And the last person, that, one of the last people to come in to see him was Abby, dear Abby, because she lived right across, you know, so they, they'd be out walking the dog or, you know, you know, doing something, mailing a letter or whatever it was, they got to know each other. And of course, he's a visible figure and, and she didn't ever picture in the paper, but she once you get to know her name and stuff like that. So they became friends, you know, just a friendly basis and things like that. So anyway. You say, why would I stop our program to tell you something like that? Well, because I, I told you, first of all, the horrible lie uh, that I knew Abby. I didn't even send her a letter. Uh, Dear Abby, <laughs> nobody likes me anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway. And, and, and besides, it helps fill up the time, you know, so that we... <laughs> Let's uh, continue here. So uh, let's uh, continue. The offender, if anyone has caused pain, therefore I, I cause. Uh, so uh, now uh, we're on verse 10 again for the second time. 
uh, for whomever you forgive anything, so do I, because we are in the presence of Christ. Christ is the one who forgives that man's sin. I say this so we might not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not unaware of his purposes. Satan, see? In other words, Satan was the one who involved that sin, whatever it was that that person had. And we don't want to be giving in to Satan by saying, you know, well, uh, we'll just uh, uh, throw him out and let him take care of himself. What you're doing is throwing him into Satan's hands. So the, the, we're, we're talking about heavy stuff here. So then now we shift to another document. Misters of a new covenant. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the odor of the knowledge of him in every place. Now, that's a strange word to use, the odor. But what uh, Paul does, and this is where scholars come in helpful, is uh, yeah, what they're talking about odor. They're not making a stink. They're me me meaning a perfume. And, and he uses this in his writing over and over and over again, talking about the odor. What he's talking about is the incense of holiness. Remember the gifts that were given to Jesus, you know, frankincense, myrrh. Myrrh was a powder that you put on a person after death. And it was to give a beautiful odor as opposed to uh, uh, an odor that is coming from a different direction. So uh, uh, this is what Paul is thinking here. It's, it's like having you know, a, a nice, beautiful aroma uh, that comes into a room of a house where they might have a, either a spray or to have flowers or to have a cleansing uh, type thing. You know, one of those little things that takes in air and cleans it for you and puts it back in. So whatever it is. So he's talking about that. He says, we are, he says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, manifest through us the odor of knowledge of him in every place. For we are the aroma of Christ for God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. That's a beautiful phrase. This, you couldn't get better than to this particular phrase here. It's one of many metaphors used by Paul. To the latter, an odor of death that leads to death. To the former, an odor that leads to life. Who is qualified for this? For we are not like the many who trade on the word of God, but as out of sincerity and need a, indeed, as from God and in the presence of God, we speak in Christ. Now, uh, dear ones, um, as I've uh, explained before, I, I do put in sometimes supplementary information that is really not part of our Pauline work directly it's not like well you know we're on the other hand it is something that can inspire us so uh, let's uh, take a, a look at what i picked out for us for this particular moment here we actually have uh, some saints and uh, from our own carmelite family let me uh yeah, my pages are stuck here Next chapter is chapter three. Saint Titus Bransma. Now you might have heard of this. He was canonized a saint just last June, even though he died in 1942, July of 1942, two weeks before Edith Stein died. He died at Dachau, she died at Auschwitz. Just in the newspaper the other day, they had something terrible about our country. They turned away uh, Jews who were coming from, escaping from Germany in the Second World War. They got turned away. And in the last group that got turned away, by the way, was a little girl who wrote a book about it, Ian Frank. And the book later was published some 10, 15, 20 years later, they found it. And uh, she was in the last group to be told, don't go back. And you know what happens when they go back is they get incinerated. So she died. She died of a, a, a disease that she picked up in the prison camp. So they counted up and said 190,000 were returned. Now, and not only that, but 140 some thousand of the seats that already had been promised to them were empty. So in other words, it was deliberate that Roosevelt 
and others. And I, I mentioned names because of how else you say it? Well, the president at the time. And in fact, one of his cabinet was a Jewish person and they just didn't, had no feeling for this, said, we don't want to have a flood of this coming in. And uh, weren't some of the people um, on a ship that they wouldn't have left land? Exactly. Of, uh, That's exactly right. In the Caribbean. And yeah, they, they, yes, they went down to, from there, they went down to Cuba to other places, yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah. Now, Titus Bransman is uh, involved in all of things, not because he was a Jew, but because he was a very, very learned president of Niemegen University in a Carmelite, very kind of frail. And uh, 600 articles that he had written were destroyed in the fire. Otherwise, we'd have a wall of things. You know, he's so learned and uh, a very profound person. And he was captured because of the fact the Nazis were against him immediately because they knew that this is one guy who was not going to let the newspapers of uh, Holland, you know, be friendly to them. He had been going around by the cardinal, told him, go around to every newspaper and tell, especially Catholic newspaper, tell them we're not going to be friendly to the Nazis. So they knew that. And as a result, uh, he is imprisoned for six months and then he is taken down to Dachau. Now, I go to Dachau every year uh, for two reasons. Uh, one reason is I go because Carmelites were killed there. And so I, I get off the plane, I get my little car, sh -sh -sh, I go to the northeast side of Munich, outside of town, to a little crossover called Moose Inning. <laughs> I think they probably have 150 people there, I suppose. I don't know. But one of them is a big inn, and I stay with the inn there. It's a family run place, and I, they love me, and I love them. Then I take my little car, and I, I zoom over to Dachau. And I go into Dachau, and I go to the place. Like this would be a model of Dachau. See, these would be barracks here coming all the way down. And barracks here. So this would be, uh, this would be uh, two, four. No, this side would be two, four, six, eight, all the way up down to 30, two, 30. Okay. These two would be for priests. You say, oh, well, that's pretty good. You know, they get a nice bump and all that. No, that was so they give them extra punishment because they hated priests. Because if they put them into other prison camps, they'd be going around talking about all this hope stuff, you know, and all this prayer stuff and, and uh, put up with, you know, so practically all the priests that they got, oh, over 2,700 priests were knocked out at this particular place, 2,700. So uh, the, uh, so I, and I go to the place because here, and here we are right up, right all the way to the back there is where the infirmary was, but the infirmary was a free uh, crematorium because in fact, what it was is you walked in there or you were carried in there, but you never walked out. So the nurse who came along uh, to give him the injection because that's what they were going to do. Uh, he, as, a, as she's just giving him the injection, he reaches and he gives her his rosary, which is carved out of like wood pieces and stuff. So it gives her his rosary. Uh, after the war, back in the 1980s, he is beatified. And when he was beatified, this woman showed up because she became a Catholic as a result of his enthusiasm of life, I guess. I, I don't know how you, you put it. They, they just to show you, at uh, Dachau, they, did not, they didn't have gas but things there. Uh, they shot Russians. With others, they starved to death. So they, they cut the bottom of his uh, skin off of his feet so that he's walking on the inside of his foot. And so when he walked out to places, stuff like that, he was in incredible, incredible pain. Beautiful story is there's a little girl there and there's a parish in the city of Dachau. And uh, so she uh, arranges with the priest that is there, a German priest at a German parish, to take communion. So she takes the communion hosts, puts them in a little tiny, you know, picks, and, uh, and then takes flowers. And so she gets onto the property because she says, I come uh, every day to bring flowers to the commandant or something like that just as a gesture, you know, oh, that's wonderful, wonderful. And then as she bikes around and stuff like that, she throws out the picks. And so anyway, later on, the priests are out there, you know, digging or shoveling or whatever, and they come back and they pick it up. And sure enough, they take the host and they take the tiniest piece they can and they pass it around. So they've all received communion, you know, wonderful story. At the beginning, the German priests were in prison there, and the German priests had more, they could say mass, whereas the other priests couldn't. 
So anyway, this, so this is, you can see the title here. It says, uh, For Faith and a Free Press, an Academic and More, uh, the Dutch Catholic Press. And so this, this, this is quite a... This is quite an uh, impressive thing. He had, he had come to the uh, United States. Anyway, um, so now, now why, why did it take so long uh, to get him? Well, because of the fact that he needed a miracle and he had one miracle, uh, they wouldn't count another one. Uh, and, and actually, uh, and they were right in this. Uh, the uh, administrative assistant that I had when I was principal at Mount Carmel uh, developed a cancer in her jaw. And so they're going to operate on the jaw to remove the cancer, to put a false plate or something. And uh, it, it, as obvious as can be. So anyway, I went to her house on Sunday and I brought a relic of Titus Bransma with me. And I placed it on her face as we prayed together about for half an hour just to talk back and forth. And uh, so the next day she goes in and they find out she has uh, something they hadn't determined before, a heart problem. So they had to do some heart operations or some part of it that needed to be repaired. So they did. So six weeks later then, they decide to go back and find out you know, what they're gonna do about the jaw. Well, they go in and they can't find anything. It wasn't like they, there was a scar or there was a twist or anything. It wasn't, there's was nothing there. It was like it was brand new and they, they were astounded. And, and so the, uh, now the family and myself and others did not call this a miracle because we not looking for that. We were looking for healing and that's what she what she experienced healing. So that's was acceptable to everybody. They just, you know, no matter what. So two years or so after that, the prior general of the Carmelites comes and he comes to Mundelein. By that time, I'm the principal of it, Mundelein. And uh, he comes to the, our rectory there, our monastery. He says, As, uh, I've heard a rumor that there was some kind of a healing here. He says, do you know uh, where I might go to, you know? And I said, well, you, you might be talking to the right person. I says, because I was there. <laughs> so uh, anyway, they go down. So they have a tribunal. So they bring in the people from Rome, you know, the experts and stuff. And they sit them up there. And I was not, I was displeased with the way they handled it. Anyway, I was the last one that they talked to. You would think uh, they, you know, if they talked to me first, maybe, but maybe they were building up to uh, who knows. But anyway, so I got there. And, and so I, I told just what I've told you. And uh, so on the way out the door, the chief guy from Rome pulls me aside and says, this is going nowhere. He says, because we do not uh, allow any recognition for things that take place in be when there's been a medical treatment. In other words, because of the fact that she had this heart thing, uh, said deal with the heart, she had medicine and all this other stuff. And then stuff over here. Well, you don't get rid of cancer of the jaw by giving you a heart message. <laughs> yeah. So, but they wouldn't accept it. So now the story continues and these, the Carmelites are a, a great uh, people for getting sick. So this, uh, this fellow got sick uh, two years ago, got sick, very sick. Uh, he was actually sick for about eight years with cancer and it just kept growing and growing and growing. So he was going nowhere. Uh, and uh, so all of a sudden, he goes into his usual doctor visit. And the doctor checks everything out and says, well, you don't have to come in anymore. He says, why is that? He, he says, uh, I don't know who you've been praying to. He said, but, but they're, uh, they're, they're, you, don't, you don't have cancer. There is no cancer. You're done. Don't come back. Mm. And so, they, so then they had to go check everything. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. He was cured of his cancer. So. And this was a total cancer. It wasn't like a, you know, something of your body or your liver or something like that. So uh, anyway, so they had the uh, uh, program last uh, June. I was going to go, but I was already going on a trip to Israel. So, so you might want to read that. Then the next one here is uh, an astounding one. Uh, it is called Edith Stein, in case you haven't heard of this name. Everybody knows her by that name. Sister Teresa Benedict of the Cross said, oh, she was a sister, a religious sister. Yes. Well, it's obvious then she was a you know, brilliant woman. She was a, uh, 
what, what is this business about her being a convert? Well, she came from a family of six children. She was the last and uh, second last. Her, uh, she had a, a little sister. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, she lost her faith of uh, Judaism because she was a Jew. Her father had died when she was young. And the mother ran the business, and she actually was a much better business person, and she made bundles of money. And they were very, very strict uh, Jews. I, I was actually able to walk into the house where she uh, lived and grew up and stuff like that. I said, well, how did you do that? Well, I said, there was a, a Polish guy there, who, you know, had the key to the house. And he would uh, just, you know, uh, keep people away from the place. But, um, you know, there's what they call the Chicago handshake. I don't know if you ever heard about that. Well, you don't, you, you, you know, you don't have a naked palm, you know. Oh, <laughs> they'd walk me through the whole building. So anyway, he smoked uh, cigarettes by morning. He, he says, I, I, I can't take this. And I said, use it for your cigarettes. Said, oh, yeah. All right. So Edith Stein became a convert and she was brilliant. Uh, in a, a secular newspaper in uh, 1885 called her the woman of the century. This is before they knew that she was going to convert to Catholicism and all that. It was her brilliance of, as a philosopher. And uh, you can see that it's got a good uh, description here uh, on her work. Uh, she studied under Husserl, who himself later became a Catholic on his deathbed. And uh, she went to, to uh, a school in uh, Germany. And the difficulty she had was that she was a woman and a Jew. So there's no chance of getting a, a university position. She taught at a Catholic school for a while, but that came later. And so what, what happened was she was uh, uh, visiting friends and they were going away for the weekend that said, uh, here's our house. He said, we got a nice library there, pick a book. So she went there. Now, is this the Holy Spirit or not? She picks a book and, and says, uh, this is odd. It says, uh, Teresa of Avila. Carmelite sister says, I don't know anything about them. So she read the book and she read it all the way through the night. Didn't go to bed, read the whole book because uh, it was the autobiography, uh, the book of her life, read the book into the night when Finney said, this is the truth. So the next day she bought a Catholic catechism and a missile. As a phenomenologist, Stein was convinced of the truth of St. Teresa's experience. Truth is experience led her to the truth itself. Stein was baptized Catholic in 1922. Now, this is intriguing because she's a phenomenologist. Now, phenomenology is a branch of philosophy which says instead of learning about logic or, you know, uh, the, the development of mathematics or other type things, you know, uh, uh, you know, virtues and other type stuff. Instead, uh, what phenomenology is that you learn from the other person. See, in other words, you learn from you let the objective uh, come to you. So it wasn't about giving. Uh, you know, a logic lesson. It was about hearing the heartbeat and heart of another person. So it really was kind of a combination of philosophy and psychology. And uh, the Husserl that, that she uh, studied under uh, and, and, the, and the colleagues that she was with were all people who were open to faith experience, but uh, later in life. So she goes, she goes uh, downtown one time in uh, Frankfurt and there's a church door open. And they said, the other person says, let's stop in, a, a boyfriend. So let's stop in. So they stop in. And she sees a woman there, a middle-aged woman, who was shopping, and her shopping bag is right next to her. And she was kneeling uh, in the church, uh, praying. And she was so imbued with the extraordinary mindset of somebody coming in out of a busy day and kneeling and praying while, while you're shopping. She said, I can't understand this. Well, you know, all of this is the Holy Spirit at work, is it not? Because, you know, you know, you know the regular person go in and say, well, that's kind of silly to, you know, you know maybe, maybe it was going to rain later and you got out of it. Who knows? So anyway, uh, she uh, then starts to want to become a Catholic, but her mother, you know, said, I'll die if you become a Catholic. So anyway, she had to wait. But, you know, eventually she became baptized. And then she wanted to become a Carmelite nun. And of course, again, the mother was gonna, was gonna die. <laughs> and she hated her daughter for even thinking of it. But she goes to the convent in, uh, in uh, up in, uh, in 
Germany, right off of the Rhine River. Uh, in, um, and so uh, she goes there uh, and uh, then uh, uh, goes through their novitiate and stuff like that. I was able this last summer, uh, these are the type of things I live for. I received, certified, a little tiny square about the size of your thumbnail of white cloth. And it was part of the dress that Edith Stein wore when she became a Carmelite. In other words, if you want to join a, one of these religious orders, you were a bride of Christ. So they dressed you up as a bride. And then you walk down the aisle and stuff. And then they start to take off the things of the bride and put on the things of the religious. So that's what she did. So now uh, I, I visited them uh, some 10, 11 years ago now. Uh, the two of us went, uh, Father Dave Dillon and myself, went to the Passion Play in Oberhammergau. And he wanted to see his niece, and I wanted to see the place where uh, Edith Stein was. So uh, we go forth. And, go up at, uh, and get, uh, we get a little bit lost. So, uh, you know, when I come to the uh, place where she was, um, I, ran, I, I went up there and there was a nun who was locking the door. So I said, we're too late, you know, for the uh, evening vespers. They allow people to come in. She said, yes, I'm sorry. I said, but uh, I said, but you do have an eight o'clock mass tomorrow morning. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. And now I got another priest here with me. Can he come in? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. She's eyeballing me up and down and stuff like that. And then she goes in. Her name is Sister Mary Magdalene. And so anyway, we come in in the morning and we're in the back and uh, standing there. And she's waving us to come into the sacristy. So can we go in? She's got our albs laid out for us and our thing. So we uh, can celebrate the mass. So they ask uh, him. Uh, Father Dave says, uh, the, the priest, he's a, a discalced priest. So he said, uh, would you read the gospel? And he looks at me like, what? <laughs> so I, I, I said, uh, he doesn't speak uh, German. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so he said, would you read the gospel? I said, oh, sure. I, I'm glad to. So I, I did. I had to apologize for my American accent. And uh, they was all <laughs> chuckled on that. And, uh, uh, and I also was able to uh, be part of the uh, Eucharistic prayer. So that was nice. And then the sister came and she gave me a, a relic of Edith Stein too. So anyway, so I, I felt a remarkable woman, um, absolutely remarkable. So anyway, there's, that's those are things you can read there. Then you can see the next thing we have is chapter three. And you want to have some things to say? So we're are we uh, have we used up our time? Yes. Okay. Yes. Finish next time. We we are finished. Oh. The, we, the, this is just the extra of the part. So. Hmm? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm stop the recording. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Okay, thank you all for listening. We're stopping the recording for now. We'll see you next week. <laughs>